University of Kansas, KU, am I? No. Um, Ross grew up on a small farm in central Kansas near Geneseo. Let's hear it for Geneseo. Right? Yeah, there we go. All right. Yeah. And he went to high school in Ellsworth. Ellsworth? Anyone? Anyone? Ellsworth? Okay. It's, it's a great cow town. Okay. Um, being a meteorologist is a lifelong dream, and Ross enjoys everything Kansas weather sends our way. Please give a warm, fresher welcome to Ross Jansen. Well, it's great to be here this morning. I do enjoy getting out uh, and talking about Kansas weather and sharing uh, my knowledge about Kansas skies. Hopefully you'll leave here today with a little bit of something special. So when you watch thunderstorms this spring and this summer, you'll know a little bit more about Kansas weather. I've wanted to be a meteorologist ever since I was in fourth grade. It's one of those that, you know, you kind of grow up knowing exactly what you want to do. And it was easy for me going through middle school and high school knowing that that's exactly what I want to do. So set a goal for myself. It was a lot of work to get there. And if I had to go back and do school again, I would probably pick something totally different because uh, meteorology school is extremely difficult, a lot of math, a lot of physics, some chemistry, definitely one of those programs that you got to put a lot of work into it if, if you're going to get through it. So talk a little bit more about where I grew up for those of you that don't know exactly where Geneseo is because I had somebody ask me one time if it was foreign. Uh, it's not. <laughs> it's right in the middle of the state. And it's right on the Ellsworth-Rice County line. It takes me about an hour and a half to drive from Wichita back to see my mom and dad. My mom and dad, by the way, still look after a whole bunch of cows. I still like to go home and help out when I get an opportunity. And just so you know, growing up as a farm kid, most of the time, if you're in agriculture, you're probably thinking K-State. My family all went to K-State, grew up in a family with purple blood. And I'll never forget my high school counselor telling me, you can't get a meteorology degree at K-State. So that day, I kind of had to change gears. And I'm thinking, oh, no, what am I going to do? Uh, but I had to go on to that other school to get a meteorology degree. Now, OU still has probably one of the best atmospheric science programs around. But I couldn't afford out-of-state tuition. So I ended up going to the University of Kansas to get a four-year degree, Bachelor of Science in Atmospheric Science know a lot about the sky, don't know a lot about tsunamis and earthquakes, although a lot of second and third graders sure seem to think that I do. Okay, let's do a 10 question quiz and then we'll jump into a little bit about springtime thunderstorms and then I'll talk a little bit about the technology that we use and then we'll wrap things up with a little El Nino, La Nina discussion and we'll save some time for questions at the end. Let's see how your Kansas knowledge turns out. So the largest hailstone diameter in Kansas, what do you think? Yeah, eight inches. So that's a picture of it. Actually fell in West Wichita about seven or eight years ago. That would be two baseballs side by side, and even then, probably a little bit larger than that. Obviously, a hailstone of that magnitude sometimes will penetrate a, a roof. Uh, just kind of interesting to see hail get that large. TV meteorologists issue watches and warnings for Kansas. Yeah, that one's definitely false. So the National Weather Service meteorologists are the ones that are in charge of issuing watches and warnings for Kansas. We all have the same education. So the National Weather Service meteorologists, you know, they have four year degrees as well. They issue the watches warnings. We get the information instantly. We go on TV to talk about where the storm is, where it's going, try to alert the public, get the information out. Which one of the following does not make a thunderstorm severe? Yeah, lightning is the correct answer here. You know, if we had to cut into programming for every time we had lightning storms, uh, oh my gosh. We, we already get enough hate mail when we cut into Survivor and The Amazing Race. You wouldn't believe some of the emails and phone calls that we get. I can't really share most of them with you because the language is pretty bad, but we do get a lot of hate mail. But one inch hail, tornado, 58 mile per hour winds, if we have one of those other three, it does make a thunderstorm classified as severe. EF5 tornadoes in Kansas are considered rare. 
Okay, I hear some true and false. Actually, it is true. Some people are caught by surprise by the answer to this because we think, oh yeah, tornadoes, they do happen a lot in Kansas. We can all agree on that. But large destructive tornadoes like the Greensburg one, which by the way was the last EF5 in Kansas, they are considered rare. So we've now gone more than 10 years without an F5 or an EF5 in Kansas. So they are rare. You know, when we see something like this, you just hope that people are paying attention because that tornadoes like that wipe out everything in their path and the destruction is pretty incredible. That, by the way, the Greensburg tornado was the last tornado that we had that actually killed somebody in Kansas. A green sky indicates a tornado is soon to follow. Here, false, that is actually the correct answer, okay? So when you go outside this spring and you do see a green sky, it doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna have a tornado. It does mean that there's a lot of precipitation in the storm and there's a good chance that you're probably gonna see some hail too, but a green sky can be very unnerving. It definitely doesn't mean there's uh, gonna be a tornado, but the change in color in the sky does indicate that there is a lot of precipitation that could fall. So that's an indication of what a green sky might look like. Kinda looks like something coming from outer space, but just tells you that there's a lot of precipitation. Okay, number six, how hot is a lightning bolt? 50,000 degrees, five times hotter than the surface of the sun. Just another reason why you don't want to be hit by lightning. There's a lot of other reasons. When I was going to KU to study meteorology, I was working at the TV station in Lawrence at the time, and there was a girl walking home from class one afternoon, and lightning hit a tree that was about 20 feet from her, and the electricity traveled through the ground, went up through her body and out the top of the umbrella. And when I went up to interview her a couple of years after it happened, she still had the umbrella and the clothes that she was wearing that day. And I kid you not, it looked like a tiger had gotten a hold of her and just shredded everything. The umbrella was burnt beyond really recognition. And what I thought was most fascinating is where she had a wristwatch on that day, it left third degree burn marks. The rivets on her jeans left burn marks on the side of her. It does some crazy things. Now, she doesn't have any lasting impacts from the lightning bolt, but again, lightning is five times hotter than the sun. There's no way to know still today where our next lightning strike's gonna be, but I often tell people if you can hear thunder, you are close enough to a storm that you could be struck by lightning. Number seven, the average number of tornadoes in Kansas each year. Okay, I'm hearing 40, I'm hearing 100, it's actually 80. So that's sort of the benchmark of what we would consider to be a normal tornado year. Last year, I think we were a little bit above normal, but most of our tornadoes were fairly small. But, you know, on a really crazy day in Kansas, we can have half of that in just one day. Tornadoes form an eye similar to hurricanes. Okay, here's some true and false. Actually, this would be false. So when we watch Wizard of Oz and we see the witch going around in the middle of the tornado, that of course is fake. The movie Twister, where they get to the end of the movie and they're huddled together and they look up and it looks like the coolest thing that might happen, that's also fake. So there's no such thing as an eye to a tornado. There is, however, an eye to a hurricane as we can see from outer space. And if you could get to the middle of a hurricane, you could look up and see blue sky. The winds would be calm. It would be a, like a nice sunny day in Kansas. But tornadoes don't form an eye. And really the reason why one does and the other doesn't is because of size of storm. So a hurricane, you know, the diameter of the hurricane winds can be 80 miles. With a tornado, it's much smaller. And so they don't actually form an eye. Which corner of the basement is safest during a tornado? Okay, at one time we thought it might be the southwest. Actually, all corners of the basement are about the same. So when you're seeking shelter from a tornado, don't worry about opening the windows. It's not gonna save your house. Don't worry about which corner of the basement. The best place to be is still below ground because tornado winds actually strengthen as you go higher up. Some of you in here have probably seen the video of the tornado that goes over the turnpike and people are huddled up underneath of the overpass. <coughs> Terrible place to be. 
because again, as you climb that embankment, the winds are actually gonna be a lot stronger in a tornado than they would be if you were below ground. Don't worry about what corner of the basement, I tell little kids, crawl under a mattress. You know, for us older adults, you know, if we could get under the staircase, those are good places to be, uh, offer this, the safest amount of protection. Last question, a meteorologist is the only job you can be wrong and still get paid. That is very false. I like the answer coming from this side of the room. We like to have a lot of fun with this. If I had a nickel every time somebody teased me about, oh, it must be nice to be wrong and still get paid, uh, I could probably retire here in another year. We don't keep track of our accuracy in the storm center. We just kind of keep on moving. Uh, very few times do we actually go back and see how well did we do because we don't really have that kind of time. We just keep looking at the new information coming in and keep moving forward. I will tell you the hardest thing that we have to forecast still is snowfall, mostly because there can be a wide range in snowfall and people measure differently. We have people that stick a stick in the ditch and tell us, oh, I got 10 inches of snow and you said two. <sighs> you know, we just, in some people's eyes, we're never gonna get it right. But snowfall is the hardest thing to try to forecast. Wind is pretty easy. Sky conditions aren't normally quite that tough but figuring out exactly how much snow still offers up a lot of challenges. Last year in the severe weather season, we didn't have that many big days. A couple of them that stand out to me, May 28th, we had the Linwood tornado. That's this one here. If you don't know where Linwood is, that's just northeast of Lawrence. Tornado touched down. It was huge. It was wrapped in rain. So when you look at this, there's a curtain of rain that's basically uh, hiding the tornado. So if you were out chasing a storm on this day, you would not want to drive into that because that's where the EF4 tornado was located. That's technically out of our viewing area. This picture up here, this was actually up north of Russell. We had a tornado touchdown and we had one of our very own storm chasers on I-70 and we sent him up there. He got in behind the storm and about 10 minutes later, we actually were able to carry a tornado live on TV. That doesn't happen with every storm, but I can tell you, if we're in a tornado warning situation, if people are tuning into our coverage and we can show them what's actually happening and go beyond the radar picture, the phone stops ringing. People, I think, find it very fascinating, but if we cut into Survivor and we're talking about a tornado and the only thing I have to show you is a radar picture, people come unglued. So <laughs> we do send out storm chasers. We have a team of about nine, Normally, we let them pick their starting location and let them kind of travel across the state to try to find the storms. And we hopefully, if we get a lot of active weather, we're able to show you actually what's happening like we do in that picture up there. Some weather identification. Again, if you've lived in Kansas most of your life, some of these are going to be familiar, but just kind of reviewing. So this springtime, when storms come rolling on through, you might have a little better understanding of what you're looking at. Wall clouds and shelf clouds might be a little bit backwards for some of you, but a wall cloud looks like this, so it's very narrow. It hangs down below the base of the cloud, and if you were out spotting a storm, looking at this picture here, you would just kind of want to sit there and watch and see what happens. Some wall clouds rotate, some wall clouds don't. Some wall clouds produce tornadoes, again, others don't. So when we're looking at this picture up here, if we were going to report this storm, we would say we have a well-defined wall cloud, but obviously we're looking at a still image, so we don't know if it's rotating or not, but that's basically a front row seat to see is the storm going to drop a tornado. Shelf clouds are going to extend for many, many miles across the horizon. So if you're out driving down the interstate and you see this giant tubular cloud that's basically oriented horizontally, that's a shelf cloud. And if that thing hits you, you're going to get blasted with a lot of wind, the rain's going to set in, and then things should begin to calm down. It almost always happens summertime, a holiday at the lake, a shelf cloud goes across the lake, it's reported as a tornado, it's not. They look kind of like a tornado, but they are, again, oriented horizontally, and there's a lot of wind that happens with it, so shelf clouds and wall clouds look very different. Shelf clouds are wind, wall clouds are, are sometimes tornadoes. Okay, let's uh, look at the next picture here, a downburst. This is what it would look like. Again, lots of heavy rain, strong winds that are coming down. Downbursts are usually very small areas of strong winds. Oftentimes, we hear about it at the station, 
before we can see it on radar. They're really hard to spot uh, when we're looking at radar. But oftentimes we'll get reports of a backyard fence that's blown down, semis are knocked off the interstate, and we'll know it was probably a downburst, and winds can go above 100 miles per hour. So if you hear of straight line winds, microburst or downburst winds, this is kind of what they look like. Strong air coming down from a storm, it does oftentimes lead to some damage. Now we talk about tornado identification. Some of this isn't going to be new to you, but obviously a rope tornado, these are going to be the most common. They're usually very short-lived, okay? So when they touch down, they'll do, depending on where they touch down, probably not a lot of damage. But interestingly enough, this makes up 90% or more of the tornadoes that we see in Kansas. By the time I get on TV to talk about it, it may or may not even still be on the ground. They usually don't last very long. This does raise the question, why do some tornadoes look black and why are some more white? And it has everything to do with where the sun is shining at the time the picture is taken. So in this illustration here, the sun would be on the other side of the storm. In this picture here, the sun would be to the photographer's back, giving the tornado more of a white color. Color doesn't really tell us much about a tornado. We don't really know how strong they are until after the storm moves on through. It drives me crazy because during a tornado warning, we'll have some people call and say, oh, I think this is an EF5. We don't know. We don't know how strong the tornado is until the survey assessment team goes out and sees exactly what has been torn apart because that will tell us how strong the winds might have been. Then we go to the stovepipe tornado, same width at the cloud base as it is down at the ground. These are considered your strong tornadoes, EF2, usually EF3, and these make up about 8% of the tornadoes that we see in Kansas. This actually happened to be out in western Kansas. One of our sky cams captured it live on the air, and again, as soon as we cut into programming and we go to a live picture, oh, people think that's fascinating. They, they really find it interesting. Uh, this was actually out by Dodge City from one of our storm chasers. Fascinating to watch, but again, if you put that in a populated area, it's going to tear up a lot of stuff. And then of the violent tornado, less than 2% of all the tornadoes that we see in Kansas fit into this category. This tornado happened up north of Salina. Kind of hard to see, but you can't miss the wedge. I mean, right there, there's a little bit of rain going around the storm. And then this one was up by Canopolis Lake went about six miles south of where I grew up. And like all good Kansans, my mom calls me the next day to tell me, oh yeah, we saw it. So even my folks sometimes don't pay attention to the warnings, but you can definitely see it's very, very large down at the base of the, at the, base of the cloud and down at the ground as well. That one got an EF4 rating, and this one again was up north of Salina. Okay, let's talk about the tools and technology that we use to track storms. We still have the Doppler radar. I think what's cool nowadays, most of us, obviously with smartphones, we can pull up the radar and check it about any time, but that radar information comes from a network of 160 radars scattered across the country. Get a lot of people that want to know what happens if the radar dies in the middle of a tornado. Well, we in Wichita and South Central Kansas, we have this radar down here in Northern Oklahoma. We're kind of on the edge of the radar up by Topeka. So thank goodness we have this network so that if one goes down, there's usually another radar that's close by that can help get us through the event, but 160 radars across the United States. We did get a new upgrade to the radar about five or six years ago, and it's what we call dual polarization radar. Big word, but really what it means is that when the radar beam goes out now, which by the way, the radar in Wichita is actually out by the airport, so if you ever take off from Eisenhower, look off to the west and you'll see that giant white ball. That's the Doppler radar. And the upgrade now allows us to see what is the radar beam hitting. Are we hitting large wet snowflakes? Are we hitting small dry snowflakes? Are we hitting mushy hailstones or are they solid? The radar beam can tell us that. This is an example of a tornado. So in this panel over here, you're looking at the wind in a tornado. Right there it is, south of Chapman up in north central Kansas. On this panel here, see that big blue blob there that's passing near Chapman? Well, notice how they match up with each other. So what you're looking at in this panel here tells us the tornado is picking stuff up and throwing it into the air. And when the radar beam goes out, 
it says, now wait a minute, that's not a raindrop or a snowflake or a hailstone, that's a non-meteorological target. And so this is what we call a debris ball. And so the tornado's picking stuff up in the air and the radar knows it's not something that's a raindrop or a snowflake. So pretty cool technology. This is very, very useful at night. Chasers can be out there, they really can't see, but radar is offering up some really cool tools. Okay, and then we still have a weather balloon that we send up. The weather balloon goes up a total of four times every day in Kansas. And this is what it looks like. It's basically a thick latex material. And we would inflate this with helium gas so that when it's fully inflated, it's about five and a half to six feet in diameter. The base of the balloon then is secured with a tight string so that no gas can escape. And the string is then tied to this instrument right here, what we call a radio saw. So when we get this all, the balloon aired up and all of this attached and we take it outside and turn it loose, this thing will take off and go soaring through the sky. I've got a video, but I'm not sure if it'll play today or not. But the radio sawn goes up through the atmosphere to go up to about 80,000 feet. So it's even a lot higher than most aircraft. And the whole time the balloon is ascending, it's growing in size. And it will grow to be the size of a small house. And then it pops and it starts coming back down to the ground, which is where the third piece of the balloon, the parachute, unfolds and it floats back down to the ground. A lot of second and third graders want to know if they can get hit on the head by a falling weather balloon. Uh, it's never happened because the parachute doesn't allow it to float back down to the ground. But this radio saw in here, there's a place inside for a 9-volt battery. And what we're most interested in, temperature, humidity. And we also measure the pressure, and then we track it to see where it goes because that tells us what the wind is doing. And the whole time this is ascending through the atmosphere, it's radioing back down to the ground what it's measuring. So what I think is really fascinating about the weather balloon is that if you've ever wondered how do we know what the weather's going to be like tomorrow and four days from now, this is where it starts. We measure the atmosphere now. We put it into a giant computer that does a bunch of mathematical calculations. And when it's done, then we get to analyze the maps to figure out what happens next. The weather balloon is very fascinating to me because when I was fifth or sixth grade, my dad, we were out checking cows one day and we actually found one in our pasture and we had no idea what we had discovered. It looks like a pile of trash because if you find one, you know, the balloon is busted and off to the side is a, is a parachute. The radio sounds probably buried underneath all of that and so you don't really know, but on the side, it does say harmless weather instrument and there's an envelope that's carried with it so you would mail this back and this can be used over and over again. But the weather balloon, the balloon itself, the parachute, the instrument, the gas that's involved in inflating it, it's about $300 for every balloon that goes up. There are four total in Kansas and even though technology's gotten a lot better, we're still sending up balloons. Now, I think probably in the next eight to 10 years, there will be something that replaces the weather balloon because it is expensive. We don't quite know what it's gonna be just yet, but I'm telling you, this is the starting point of how we forecast the weather. So it goes up at 6 a.m., 6 p.m. Again, temperature, humidity, and the wind, that's what we're most interested in. I don't know if you guys can click on this video or not. It may or may not play, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, but from start to finish, it takes about 15 minutes to get the balloon inflated and to tie the string around the bottom that's then taken outside and turned loose. On really windy days, this video is kind of funny to watch. Uh, the balloon sometimes will go flying horizontally and it does take two people on a windy day. One person carrying the balloon, another person carrying the instrument, and as soon as they turn it loose, it'll go floating along horizontally and then pretty soon it takes off and it does start to go on up through the atmosphere. Another piece of the tool, again, we talked a little bit about Doppler radar. It had a new upgrade two years ago. We used to have to wait six minutes for a new picture from the radar, but this new software upgrade now gives us a picture every two to three minutes. So we don't have to wait quite as long because six minutes in a tornado warning is an incredibly uh, significant amount of time. But this new radar upgrade giving us a faster scan of storms. 
Where is meteorology and the science headed from here? Well, I like to kind of think of it like the medical field. They're always doing new research because imagine if we could evacuate this area two hours before a tornado hit. If you got a notification on your phone saying there's a 90% chance there's going to be a tornado here in an hour and we could move people out of the path, that would be pretty significant. That would save a lot of lives. We're not there yet, but there's a new model that's being developed down in Norman, Oklahoma that, we're, that we've been using now for a couple of years, and it's scary how accurate it is. So here's an example from just uh, about two weeks ago. Look at what the model was saying, and look what actually happened. See the rain snow line from about uh, just north of Oklahoma City up to about Tulsa? I mean, again, very, very close in accuracy. So the forecasts are getting better. I know we get teased a lot about, oh, just, you know, give it two days, it'll be totally different. Not really so much anymore. Usually when we're five to six days out from a storm, we're pretty close. Again, snowfall still the hardest, but these models that we're using are getting a lot better, and it's all because of the research that's being done with storms that are nearby. New satellite technology. Three years ago, we put a new satellite in space. We can now see lightning. You can kind of see it here. We can see lightning strikes in thunderstorms across the United States and out over the ocean. And just new technology. We used to have to wait 30 minutes for a new picture from space. Now we can get a new picture every minute. I can actually see thunderstorms going up before we see anything on radar. It's that fast. The, the satellites that we have in space now are just so much better. So what kind of spring are we about to have? A lot of questions about this. Well, just so you know, it's looking like March is probably going to be wetter than normal and also colder than normal. So I know the groundhog came out a couple weeks ago and said early spring. Not really. Uh, we don't think that's going to be happening. What we're seeing right now on some of our longer range computer models is that it's looking like we're probably going to have colder than normal temperatures here going into the month of March. It looks like the month as a whole, all this blue and green that you're seeing, that's the computers telling us it's probably going to be a little bit colder than average for most of the country. And when it comes to precipitation, we're thinking easily maybe two or three inches of precipitation in the month of March, which is going to be rather significant, I think, for, for most of the plains. So spring overall this year, it's a good chance of above normal moisture. Not likely that we're going to have a big warm up anytime soon. And I'm thinking that an active weather pattern will ultimately mean that we're going to probably have more severe weather events this spring than what we saw last year. Again, we had above normal tornado count last year, but I think this year may offer up even more chances for strong to severe thunderstorms. So we'll, we'll see what kind of spring we have. Several people ask me, are we going to have a lot of tornadoes this spring? Yeah, I can't very well go on TV and say this is going to be, you know, not a bad spring. Because if we have one day and a tornado hits your house, it's a bad spring. Okay, so that's one of those where in winter time I can say we're going to have a lot of snow this winter. And that's a little bit easier to verify, but tornado season's different. There's no way to know exactly how many we're going to have, how bad the season's going to be. Again, because if it's something hits your place, it's going to be a bad spring. So if you like to follow along with weather information, I do have a blog that is running on our weather app. It's right down at the very bottom. It's the Storm Team 12 weather app. Uh, I'm not here to, as an advertisement for our app, but if you're interested in following along, there's a lot of information I put up there as, as I start to see it, and it's right down at the very bottom. We have a news app and a weather app, and this is in our weather app, and so you can follow along there. And finally, if you want to follow me on Twitter, there's my handle up there. I do have a Instagram account, but I'm the worst Instagram person out there because I just, <laughs> there's a lot to manage, so I don't have a lot of stuff on there. Uh, but what I'd like to do now is kind of open it up for questions, uh, something maybe I talked about this morning, and just kind of go from there. <laughs> All right, we have a question over here.
Okay, very good. The question is, down in Fort Scott, there's a valley, and it seems like tornadoes go around that area. I will tell you that it do, there are, first of all, there are some old tales out there. You know, a tornado can never cross a river. Tornadoes will never go over mountains or go through valleys. Tornadoes can do whatever they want. So, you know, just when we start to believe something, we're gonna, it's going to be proven wrong. I really thought that there would be a tornado hit downtown Wichita about five years ago, and then it kind of veered off and went to the south, and it didn't actually go through the city. But tornadoes can go through valleys. Tornadoes can go over mountains. So don't believe anything that you've ever heard. Uh, up in Topeka, if you've ever been in Topeka, as you come in from the southwest, there's a big mound called Burnett's Mound that's southwest of Topeka. And everybody that lives in Topeka, especially um, older, older folks, used to think that tornadoes would not go over that mound. And then back in the 60s, there was a tornado that came over the Burnett's Mound and hit Washburn and went right through the city. And so people then discovered, okay, I guess we shouldn't believe that. So whatever you've heard, tornadoes can't go through valleys, tornadoes can't go over mountains, uh, tornadoes can't cross a river, they can. They'll do whatever they want. That's why the safest place is getting below ground to get away from the winds. So this is kind of a follow-up question. Thank you for coming, by the way. I'm oh, sorry. thank you. There um, you are. This is kind of a follow-up question on that. Are there like land, like land formations or like the way that the land is shaped somehow affect different like weather conditions? Okay, very good question. Will that impact weather conditions? So the answer to that is 99% no. Uh, there is such thing called an urban heat island, and what that means, if you were to put a thermometer in like downtown Wichita and put one out 20 miles from the city, you would probably see a temperature difference from inner city to outside the city. But there's no such reason to believe that the city wind farms, again, will steer any of the weather patterns that we're seeing. Some people think that storms follow I-70, storms will follow the turnpike. Again, that's all very, very small in relation to what happens above us. The reason why it looks like storms follow the turnpike or I-70 is because our prevailing winds above us go from west to east. And that happens to match I-70, which runs east-west. And so it looks like storms follow the interstate. A lot of storms, think about this, move from southwest to northeast, and that matches the orientation of the turnpike. So, no, anything here on the ground is really not going to change how weather patterns develop above us. Yes? Okay, just making sure you're looking at me. Okay. <laughs> um, folks at home want to know, where and how is Millie? Okay, very good question. So Millie passed away last spring. Um, being in this auditorium brings back memories because I spoke to a group of older folks in this same auditorium and she had gone back behind this very stage and when I called her out, uh, she stuck her head underneath the curtain and it Aww. just the whole place erupted in laughter. So coming back in here does bring back some uh, very significant memories for me. But she was 14 and a half years old. Um, Truly just, you know, I loved her to pieces. That was the hardest day of my life to have to let her go. And anyone that's ever had a pet and been down that road knows exactly kind of what I'm talking about. But I do get asked if I'm gonna replace her. Uh, I will get another dog, whether it will be like Millie, go around with me like she did, we don't know because I don't know if the next dog will have the temperament that she had. I would love to try to do that sort of thing again because we touched a lot of lives, not really thinking that we were doing that, but we'll just have to see because, uh, you know, as the healing continues for me, I would like to try that again, but we just don't know. The next dog might be a nightmare and I, <laughs> I can't well, get her out of the station, but my, we'll, my we'll is see. it's just, uh, Millie was a big part of my life too, where I remember her before I remember like what weather was, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah, a lot of people will tune in just to see her. Uh, I could be here the rest of the day sharing stories with you and I, probably the one that touches me the most is the little girl that had cancer and, you know, got to meet Millie. Uh, changed my life, maybe it changed hers, but uh, we definitely had a lot of moments that were just very touching uh, throughout the course of her life. Other questions? So I live in Richardson, Texas, and I just recently got hit by a tornado. 
Um, all of our houses, there are ranch style homes that don't have basements. Where's the best place to hide? Okay, very good question. If you don't have a basement, the next best place, closets, bathrooms, okay? Any room in a home that's small with a lot of walls and no windows, good place to go. You also wanna put as many walls between you and a tornado as you can. And the reason why we suggest that is because if you've seen pictures at, in the wake of a tornado, you know, two befores and all kinds of stuff can sometimes penetrate the exterior walls. So if you can put two or three walls between you and a tornado, that's just gonna offer up that much more protection. And closets are good because, you know, a lot of clothes and stuff hanging in there, maybe it's on the floor, I don't know. But you can wrap yourself up in that, and protect yourself. Bathrooms are good too. Obviously you're dealing with mirrors, but I have read a lot of stories, most recently two years ago, an 80 year old lady crawled in her bathtub and survived a storm, riding it out in the bathtub. Sounds crazy, but pillows, blankets, grab all that stuff, go crawl in a, in a bathtub and ride it out. It's gonna be a lot better than just sitting in a living room and waiting for the storm to pass. I know living in this area, because I, I hear from a lot of people, when the sirens go off or we start talking about tornado warnings, as humans, we wanna see it. The first thing we wanna do is go outside and start looking around for it. Well, you know, seven times out of 10, that might be okay because nothing's gonna happen. Then the other times, it may be for real. And so when you do that, you're really putting yourself in a risky situation. So closets, bathrooms, good places to go if you don't have, have a basement. Yes. Hi, thank you for talking today. It was really interesting hearing how all of the things that we believed aren't really necessarily true. What do you have to say about the butterfly effect and how little things like that can affect weather patterns? Okay, so I don't really know too much about the butterfly effect. Maybe you can share, share what you know. So basically what's stated is the flutterings of a butterfly would cause just enough difference in the atmosphere to affect, just cause a domino effect of sorts. Okay, yeah, so I haven't studied enough to really know, but my overall thought would be that it's still fairly small and probably wouldn't have a dramatic a change on weather patterns or what we're feeling locally. Again, because these are very small in relation to the bigger picture of how patterns and wind flows work. But that being said, the radar sometimes will see migrating birds and insects. So the radar is very sensitive to changes in the atmosphere and sometimes we'll see things like that from a radar standpoint. But in terms of how that might impact temperature or winds, we haven't really seen anything recently that would suggest that would have a significant impact on things. Yes. Hi, Ross. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm a big fan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my plan is to go to meteorology school after this. Um, I guess I was wondering, uh, the model that you were talking about, is that the high resolution rapid refresh model? It is. It yeah. Is. <laughs> awesome. Um, Look, you're getting a round of applause. You're off to a good start. <laughs> um, Whoever that was. Um, I guess what I guess I'm interested if you could talk a little bit more about the differences between models and what some are better for talking uh, forecasting and which ones are better for like long range and short range and the differences. Okay, so the different models that we use, there are a whole bunch of them out there. They're the one that's we're talking about here is what we call the H triple R, or we call it in office the HER, because um, it is a long name to say. But it's a short-term model, so it may only be good out to 24 hours. If you called me on a day when we're forecasting thunderstorms and wanted to know when and where, this new model is so good, I could tell you about down to the hour of when storms are gonna go up and where. It's alarming how accurate this, this model is. But that's only good out to about 36 hours. So what do we need to go out seven or 10 days? Now we're using, we have a couple different American models. One of them's called the GFS. Uh, there's another one, it's called the European model, and it will take us out uh, almost 16 days. So we have a couple of different models. Now, obviously, the farther out we go in time, the less accuracy that we're going to have, but we feel comfortable now in making 10-day predictions. If you see any prediction saying in four weeks we're going to have thunderstorms on such and such day, uh, don't buy into it. There, I understand AccuWeather is making like 90-day predictions down to the exact day. 
Science is not there yet. We can look for patterns and trends, you know, cooler than normal, above normal, those sorts of things we can do, but actually telling you sunny in 45 days, we don't really know. So lots of different models out there, really what it comes down to, you know, what kind of time frame are we looking at? Are we talking about this afternoon at 3 p.m.? We can just about nail that temperature now with these short-term models. Looking out further, we do need to use some of the other models. So that's kind of the difference in the, diff in the different models that we're using. Hi, thanks. Thanks for coming today. Um, I'm wondering, uh, as the Anthropocene continues to progress and human influence continues to become more negative on the world, if you've noticed differences in your career, like in weather and reporting. Okay, so talking more along the lines of like climate and those sorts of right. things. Okay, so in the science world, the climate change debate is really still very controversial. There's a lot of scientists out there that are, you know, where I stand on the whole thing, we all agree that the earth is warmer and things are different. The thing that's most alarming to me are these wild predictions about, you know, in 30 years, we're not gonna hardly have any snow at all, or that we're not gonna have low temperatures below 30 degrees. While some of that might sound exciting for those of you that don't like cold weather, it is having a dramatic impact on plants and animals and that sort of thing. So yes, you know, our climate is changing. We definitely know that, but the wild predictions of where we are in 50 to 100 years, I don't think we really know because our overall depth of knowledge still isn't quite where it needs to be to be making those wild predictions. There's still a lot of information we need to learn. We need to figure out what's causing it. How do we resolve it? So those are kind of the constructive conversations we need to be having. But you know, how much are humans changing it? How much of it is a cyclical pattern? We still really don't know. But I think we can all agree that things are different now than they were 50 years ago, but we still have a lot of research that, that we really need to do. Back up there. Yeah, uh, hey, I just wanna say first, you got an electric voice, man. You were, you were bred to be a meteorologist. Uh, but outside of that, uh, what's like a regular day like for you as a meteorologist? <laughs> um, they're long. <laughs> so I get up at 6.30 in the morning and talk on the radio from about 7 a.m. until about 8.15. That's usually the time that I put together a blog about upcoming weather patterns. And then I go and try to exercise because my job is very sedentary when I get to work. I'm sitting down a lot, looking at computers, and so I try to go get some of that in. Then I get to work at 1.30 in the afternoon. I'm there until 11 o'clock at night. During severe weather situations, I'll be there until two in the morning. We put in a lot of hours, and that's just kind of how it is uh, being a meteorologist, even if even if I wasn't doing television, National Weather Service meteorologists go to work at midnight and they're there until seven or eight in the morning. Some of them come on shift at four in the afternoon and they're there until the wee hours. Our morning meteorologist comes in at 1.30 in the morning and he's there until 11.30 or 12. So he kind of works the overnight shift. Don't go into meteorology if you like to have an eight to five Monday through Friday job because the weather doesn't work that way. It's, it's very crazy. I will tell you this, you know, if there's anything you leave with today, I could have shown you a few slides because I showed some four uh, H'ers over the weekend, some of my test grades. I was a terrible student in college. I got really bad grades. Not that I wasn't trying, but my grades were really low. And all the math and all the physics, it was very frustrating for me. My first semester at KU, I was getting all C's and I was so afraid I was gonna flunk out. My ACT score was a 19. Bottom line is, even if you struggle in school, find something that you want to do, uh, set a goal for yourself and go after it because there were many nights I thought about changing my major and doing something different because I was getting terrible grades. Uh, but if you work hard in school and, and set something for yourself and go after it, you'll get there, but you, you got to work. I mean, it was a lot of work getting through some of these math classes and so it's kind of worked out. Uh, do we have any other questions? Okay. Hi. Um, so I've heard and read some things online about the possibility of new um, 5G cell phone technologies um, interfering with weather predicting technology. Could you maybe tell us what you know about that? I don't know if we'll see that much interference from 5G technology. Some of you may or may not know, but your phone actually, because it can tell you elevation, kind of works like a barometer. And they're finding ways now to pull 
uh, pressure readings from phones and incorporate that into weather modeling. So in terms of how 5G might be interfering, we actually might be better off from smartphones getting even smarter in the information we can pull from devices. But to my knowledge, we haven't seen any interference yet in 5G and how uh, it's impacting uh, forecasting. A lot of wind farms that are going up now, the blades, because they're so high in the air, we can see wind farm wind farms on radar. So there is some interference now in wind farms going up near radar sites because it creates this illusion that there's a storm on radar when actually what we're seeing are the tops of wind farm blades that are circulating. But 5G, to my knowledge, hasn't created a lot of issues for us yet. I've got the Storm Team weather app, Storm Team 12 weather app on my phone, so you should too. <laughs> um, please, please join me and help me thank Ross Jansen one more time. Thank you.